Hi, today I'm here with Holly McKay, a foreign policy expert and war crimes investigator. She was a journalist at Fox News Media for over 14 years, focusing on warfare, terrorism, and crimes against humanity. Holly's also the author of Only Cry for the Living, the memos from inside the ISIS battlefield. Holly, can we kick off with a little bit about your story? Yeah, well, it wasn't something that I really intentioned. Uh, growing up in Australia, I went to boarding school really young and I was a ballet dancer. And so I thought that I would go into either a ballet career or something in the arts. I always loved to create things. So I always sort of had that love for writing. But I broke my ankle and I ended up studying in New York and getting an internship. And at that point, I really didn't know what an internship was. It wasn't something that we really had in Australia, but people were talking about it and I wanted to do that too. So I ended up doing that at Fox. That was 2006, sort of the very beginning of that digital era and ended up getting sponsored and started my career really young. And I was in Los Angeles doing more general assignments. I was doing some investigative stuff, entertainment stuff and all over the place. But I always knew that there was something that I wanted that fulfilled me more. And I had a really deep curiosity for the world. And at that point, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were really at a peak point. And I just wanted to try to understand people and things a little bit better. So I was sort of doing a lot of traveling and it just become a place that I felt very comfortable in, in, in working in sort of faraway places and really trying to just speak to the regular people and trying to convey that message to an audience really far away. Wow. Breaking your ankle just took you in a whole different direction. <laughs> certainly did but you know I, I learned a lot from ballet so I certainly people think it's obviously really far removed career but it does give you sort of a lot of the foundation so to speak of, of understanding the world and understanding uh, different cultures and music and, and the way that arts is perceived in different places so they're all things that I learned really young and I think that's really what piqued my curiosity well let's jump into it what are your top three principles for success I definitely think discipline, that is something I learned from my ballet days, is just you have to give it everything. And it's not a half job. It's not a nine to five. It's not something that is, you can kind of go and break away from it. It really is a lifestyle job. And it's something that's all consuming. And in so many ways, whether it be learning languages, whether it be studying different cultures, different places, keeping up with the news in that place, understanding, you know, in my case, the different terrorist groups that are operating on the ground and who they are and how they started and, and what their ideology is. So it's just sort of a endless barrage and especially when you are working in so many different countries you're really trying to keep up with so many different countries so it really is as I say it's it's a lifestyle job you have to be fully disciplined and fully committed the second part I would probably say would be compassion and I think it's sometimes a little bit of a misnomer that a war reporter has to be this sort of tough and rough and understand every caliber of every weapon and who made it and when it was made and its sort of impact. And it, that definitely has a place and it's very important. But I think for me in the sort of journalism that I like to do, I like to, I guess, come at it from a place of compassion and just sitting with people and understanding it and telling their stories. And in a place like Afghanistan, where I am now, I mean, every person has a war story. Every person, every shop seller, on the street, every barber, every person that you know is, is standing outside a hospital, they all have these sort of very rich and really enlightening stories to tell. And, and sort of that inner you know, principle for success for me is to be able to take these stories and to tell them to people in a sort of a compelling way. And then the third thing I would say definitely with this kind of work, it's a support system. And that might be your family, that might be really close friends, that might be colleagues, it might be people that you can turn to, that you can talk to on a regular basis, especially when you are working in a country that is far away, and just sort of tell them what you're seeing, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and have that system of people that will understand or not necessarily understand because they've been there, but understand from the point of view that they can be a somewhat sort of a vessel for the things that you're going through. And I think that is something, you know, perhaps in in the early days of my career and in my 20s that I didn't kind of take all seriously. I, I was very enclosed and sort of, especially being a writer, you you spend a lot of time I'm alone and, and I sort of just soldiered that. And then as I got older and with more experience, I started to really realize how important that was for me to do the best job that I could do. Awesome. Now, Holly, this is where we have fun. We're going to take these principles apart and turn them into some practical how to's. Okay. We'll, we'll start with the first one. And I, I like your view. This is actually my first principle too. So we have this shared principle and I like how you referenced it as all consuming. How would you go about turning this into a practice? 
really for me, it's pushing through when you don't want to do it. And having said that, you've got to be mindful of burnout and, you know, taking rest breaks and all of that. But with this sort of once, you have to just push through. I have to, you know, for example, today, I spent the day at a, um, at a hospital, a pediatric hospital in Kabul, where a lot of the babies had really severe uh, congenital defects. And it's often triggered by malnutrition and it being in an impoverished country. The moms that don't get that adequate prenatal nutrition. Before we spoke, I'm sort of sitting here and going through the data and, and doing the transcript. And I was like, I cannot write this today. Like I'm looking at the photos, but... I recognize that I have to do it. I have to get this done before I go to sleep tonight. It has to be published tomorrow or the next day. And then I have to be able to, you know, continue to do other stories that are equally as important. So there really isn't that kind of lag time. So for me, it's soldiering up and doing it. It's pushing through the moments where you want to go out and have fun and chill out. And there is a place for that. But usually for me, working in a war zone, I'm here for a time that I won't get back. And I sense the importance of the work that I'm trying to convey. And I can take a a chill when I go back to the US when that is, but while I'm here, it's just a matter of staying on it, of constantly staying on the news, of constantly trying to perfect a language skill, of constantly trying to just sort of communicate and focus on what stories I can do, ensuring the quality, but there's no remedy for just doing it. And that's sort of what I have to keep myself afloat and motivated to just sort of push through that lag time. Yeah, it's a lot of what you referenced is around mindset. And I like your line, time you will not get back. So it's time you won't get back, which is a good driver saying, hey, I need to make the best use of what I have now. Anything else that sort of picks you up? I feel like this is one where a lot of people have goals, but then they struggle to develop that real discipline you need to make the progress towards those goals. Yeah, I guess for me, that discipline is really driven from just a passion. And it's something being in a war zone, being in a place as horrific as sometimes it can be. You have to believe in what you're doing. You have to believe that there are people there who are going to read it and that somehow it's going to make a difference. And you have to just be fully committed and in essence, love what you do. And I do love what I do, even though it obviously comes with its own hardships, but it's, it's a passion and I've got to keep reminding myself that this is a time, this is a critical time in the lives of many Afghan people. And it's something that I can't just sit and wait today, wait two days. It's just, it's pushing forward. It's pushing forward. And I think that really is renewing my passion and things that I do to kind of keep motivated, obviously, is to listen to a lot of other people, a lot of our experts in a place like Afghanistan, to listen to a lot of podcasts and while I'm working and just sort of take that passion that I also feel from my colleagues and from other people that are doing this work and try transfer that into my own work and keep just that drive forward. You know, when you have big ambitious goals, there tends to be this pretty big distance between you and that goal. I feel like on a daily basis, a lot of times it's hard to sense that progress. I'm wondering if there's things around that specifically you've ever been challenged with or think about to like, how do you keep that momentum going and determination to keep pushing along? Mm -hmm. I think I've always had a pretty strong work ethic and that probably does go back to my ballet days and quite young I was working professionally um, sort of in the arts world. I have been on my own for a really long time. I went to boarding school really young so I've kind of always had to I guess rely on myself to make enough money to make ends meet, rely on myself to kind of get from A to B. So I think I always have that independent spirit and that helps with the discipline aspect of it too because and I think that's again one reason I wanted to be a writer more so than to go into say television or something with that in, sort of entailed bigger crews is that I wanted to be responsible for my work and I didn't want to necessarily it's not about sort of bartering responsibility but I think it was for me I wanted that sort of creative control and I wanted to know that it was up to me to get it done and I couldn't sort of rely on other people to sort of shoulder the work I think having that sense of personal responsibility for what you need to get done is a really sort of big factor in, in driving it because there is nobody else who's going to sit there and write there is nobody else who's going to sit there and do this interview or do this transcript or get this pitch this story somewhere so at the end of the day I'm the only person who can do that and I think I think in this sort of work, you also feel a very strong obligation to the stories that you're telling and to the people that you're telling it, because so often you're their only voice to the outside world. You're the only person who sort of can communicate and, and without that, nobody would know who they are. Nobody would know sort of their story. And so I do, I never want to take their story from them, but I want to be able to sort of convey it in the best way possible. That is something I take really seriously, especially when people are opening up to you about very traumatic experiences in their lives or, or taking a huge safety risk and speaking to a journalist in a precarious time. And that's something I don't want to ever take for granted. And so 
I view it sort of as it's not really about me, it's about them. And I have a personal sort of obligation to them to follow up and do as I said that I was going to do. So I take my motivation from my subject matters. Yeah, it's interesting. You define accountability for yourself and then take ownership of it. Let's talk about compassion. How would we turn the idea of compassion, connecting with people into some practical steps? Yeah, I think that is sort of the key. And that's sort of what I don't like to sort of differentiate a little bit between say, you know, a man and a woman in a war zone. But generally speaking, what I find with a lot of my male colleagues is they probably have a lot more interest in sort of the military aspects of things. So understanding the firefight, understanding the weapon. And I think that's all really important. And that is a part of my job as well, but it's really not the main thing. It's sort of something we call the bang bang, but it's not the thing that motivates me the most. What really motivates me are those human stories. And often those human stories are not necessarily coming from officials. I often finding when you're talking to, to leaders or presidents or whoever it may be, it's not the most compelling and they usually have an agenda to fulfill. And it's a little bit dry for me. I like to sort of sit with the regular people. I like to be able to sort of sit because I find that their stories are the most compelling. They're the stories of survival and resilience. These incredible that just people that you would just never a suspect walking down the street and you sort of sit with them and you have tea with them and there's this sort of trove of information that comes out when you form that human connection and I'm always very mindful of I guess never getting to a place where you no longer feel something for that subject and I have definitely been there and that's when I know to take a break because I don't think I can write effectively. I don't think I can interview effectively if I don't have that sense of compassion and emotion and being able to somehow really sort of empathize or sympathize with what people are going through. And we talk about compartmentalization a lot. And I do think you have to compartmentalize to a certain degree. I mean, you can't take on everything that comes your way. And especially being in Afghanistan, it's sort of everybody's coming at you wanting help to leave, wanting you to fill out paperwork, wanting you to sponsor them. It's an endless bombardment. And that's something I really had to learn to take a step back from and tell people, you know, that's not my job. I'm not a rescue organization. I can't get you out. But my job is as a journalist and my job is to tell a story and you can use that story to further your case or however that is. But I do not have the, the sort of capacity to do that. And I think it's always hard to tell people and it's hard for them to understand, especially in a challenging situation. But it's something I've really had to learn to do the past couple of months. And so to a degree, that's a compartmentalization for me. But I never want to lose my compassion for those people. I never want to lose my depth of understanding for what they're going through and what of situation and future that they're facing. So I've always been very firm in maintaining that. I think there is also sort of this line where people think that you know, journalists can't show emotion or can't, um, can't go above and beyond to be a support system for people that they're interviewing. And I sort of push back against that because I really think that as a storyteller, my job is to tell their stories and to get that rapport that is necessary. And that requires really getting to know people and sitting in their homes and just spending time with them. And so compassion to me is it's just so often the solution to not only telling a good story, but to a lot of the foreign policy conflicts and quagmires and, and communication breakdowns that we face. I think if we're able to take a step back and to look into people's shoes a little bit, I think we'd have a better understanding. And even now with having to constantly interact with and, and interview the Taliban, I have to sort of take a step back and recognize that this is new to them as well. Having a woman in the room, having to sort of talk about a lot of these issues, this is something that a lot of these men who have spent the better part of the last 20 years fighting in the mountains somewhere, and then to suddenly you know, be, in a, be in a city and, and having to run a country. And a lot of them haven't seen a woman outside their mother or sister or daughter. And so suddenly to sort of have somebody like me kind of in their face, I recognize that sort of the hostility that might come from that is really just comes from this sort of sense of not understanding. And I feel strongly of coming from a place of recognizing that as much as it's new to me, it is also new to them. And that definitely helps me with being able to sort of build that rapport and conduct what I would hope to be would be an insightful interview. Yeah, a lot there. It sounds like Holly listening is such a key component of all of this to be able to get the stories, to get into the various emotions that come out of the stories, to be empathetic to the person you're ha ha talking to. I feel like sometimes we're losing that in terms of just the ability to listen. I'm wondering if you have an approach that you take to really stay focused, to really listen to that other person and get that information to be compassionate. 
a lot of times get distracted with our own thoughts or our own agenda and things we're specifically tactically digging in for or, or looking for. I'm just would love to hear your specific approach to stay focused. In this. Yeah. So in interviews, I used to sort of just take my hand. I was sort of very old fashioned about it. And I really resisted technology. And I would just take my notebook and just shorthand everything that was being said. And if that wouldn't you know, make it obviously easy to do transcript, providing I could understand what I was writing. But I've actually taken to a lot more now. I go in with my phone, I have an app that I record on and, and I just sort of press record and, and let it go. And I think that's really helped me to list, be a better listener because I'm not so focused on listening to my translator, writing, writing, writing. So I think that's really just a key for me is just knowing, okay, I'm safe. I've got this recorded. I'm not going to miss anything. And if my interpreter misses something, we can both go back and listen to the recording again. So I think that's really just sort of helped me be in the moment and being able to just sort of sit there and have a conversation that doesn't feel intimidating, that's tends to flow naturally. I do have my notebook on me and that's really just to take note of any sort of key body language or take notes of, of the details of the room and things like that, that I think are really important for a compelling story. And then also if I have a follow-up question in my head that I'm worried that I may forget later, then I'll just sort of jot a note down for that. But I don't do sort of the shorthand interview sort of writing that I used to do. And I think sort of in getting out of being a little bit of a tech dinosaur, it's actually really helped me to be that better listener and to be able to really look at somebody in the eye as I'm speaking to them and just know that it's a conversation at the end of the day, that to be as present as possible I don't want my mind to sort of distracted with having to remember everything in that moment. The skill of its own being present. I like it. Let's talk about support system. What would be a practical approach to developing a support system if you don't have one? Yeah, I think it's being a little bit vulnerable too. I think that so often we don't talk about the mental health aspects of the work. And for a long time, it's been this sort of, you can't talk about that. You know, there are a lot of people going through much worse things than you are. And of course, on a daily basis, I'm confronted with people who are going through you know, really horrific things. And, and I often think, you know, who am I to ever complain? Who am I to ever feel sorry for myself? Who am I to ever feel in any way hard done by a week, whatever complication in my life arises. But I think that's sort of an important thing to acknowledge that we're all human and no matter who we are, we're, we're always going to have our own you know, personal and professional problems to deal with. And, and that's okay. And I think it's being a little bit vulnerable to people that's close to you and to be able to talk to them or, and on top of speaking to a therapist or professional, but just having that person that you know that you can text on a frequent basis, that you know who can just sort of listen to you vent about a situation. I think that's something that's really, really important to me. It could be family, partners, friends. And I just think for a really long time, I really isolated myself from being able to discuss a lot of those things. I thought, well, this friend is never going to understand. They weren't here. They work in a completely different industry and have a completely different life. So what are they going to be able to tell me that I can't? But I think when you have people that love you and that are close to you, it's really important to use them as a resource of that support system and that you can share with them some of those things. And I think it's also important to be a listener and to be an advocate for other people too, and away from a war zone. So even sort of when I'm here on a daily basis, I have, you know, people that I go to and talk to and text and whatever else, because I also want to maintain a connection to my other life, which is obviously my life in the United States. And, and I think that's really sort of important not to completely lose yourself in the work that you're doing, especially when you're away, but to be able to kind of keep your finger on the pulse, so to speak, in your main life, to know that, you know, even though I stay here for long periods and months on end, it's still a temporary life. The bones of my existence is still in the U.S. So I try to maintain those relationships as best I can. Now, when you develop those relationships for your support group, is it informal or essentially here's friends? I just sort of have these conversations and open up more formal about it where it's like, Hey, this is what I'm looking to do is have a period and just talk about some of the things that's going on with myself or even yourself. It's generally informal. There really isn't sort of a rhyme or a sort of structure to it, but I think sort of the friends that I tend to lean on a little bit in, in these situations kind of know what's coming um, if I preface it perhaps, but yeah, for me and everybody has, I guess, their own way of developing their support systems. For me, it's turning to those good friends and people that you know are good sort of communicators and are available and, and don't mind being harangued with, you know, a thousand texts if that's what the situation requires. I think for me, it's sort of an informal thing. 
And it's not something I think that I extend too widely. I think it's important just for me is to have two or three people that can balance me or check me or sort of keep me on an even keel or, or really just listen. And think that's often what it comes down to is I'm not looking for anyone to solve my problems, but what I really think helps me from a mental health sort of point of view is just to be able to have somebody that listens and to sort of get it out of your body. I think being a writer actually really helps with that because you have that ability to tell that story in, in a sort of written way in any way. It's sort of, it's a cathartic thing, I think, that it can leave your body, whereas I have noticed that colleagues of mine that are photographers or other things, they perhaps struggle a little bit more with the moral injury aspect or the PTSD aspect because and sort of taking photos is great, but they're still missing that catharsis. So I usually encourage as many people as I can to write because I think it's a way that you can convey stories and have them sort of released from your body. And that's something in a particular interview that I did that I may not see a fit for it immediately for a story, but having it and being able to sort of jot it down in a journal or sort of write it out, I think sort of helps me process it in a way that I can move forward. Really nice. Do you have like peers? Do you think of your support system with other reporters? A lot of journalists, especially in Afghanistan, when there sort of is a, a relatively small pool of journalists here, um, they tend to hang out together a lot and go out, and especially before the Taliban, a lot of parties and a lot of journalist gatherings. For me, that was just never my thing. I certainly have journalist friend and I am working with an amazing photographer here who's very experienced, but I was just never that person, I think, in those sort of journalist groups. And I guess my friendship circles were a little bit more people from different industries. And that's actually where I've gravitated in life. But I think for me, it's important to have friends that do things that are completely different to what I do, because again, it's sort of maintaining that holistic kind of balance in your head. And otherwise you end up in a group of journalists and, and everybody has these amazing war stories, but in that sort of all that you're processing, I think that wasn't really for me. I need my friendship circles generally to be a little bit more, perhaps really far removed from what I do. And that's what sort of keeps me healthy and motivated and not all consumed by the work, but all consumed by the work. So it's a balanced thing for me in just that little way. What's the best mistake you've ever made? I've thought about this so many times, but the best mistake to be really literal about it, I guess, was the ankle break <laughs> because that came from a mistake that I was making in a routine that I let myself get extremely burned out from my dancing career. And I sort of knew it before it was going to happen. And I remember when it sort of happened, it was obviously painful, but it was almost this sort of weird sense of relief because I suddenly felt like the 14 years that I'd been studying dancing at that point, I started when I was, you know, three or four years old, I felt a weight lifted and it gave me freedom to do something else because as much as I loved my dancing career, I just felt that there was something there and I had no idea really what that was. So the best mistake was giving into my body, so to speak. And when I had that decision to either go back to that career once I'd healed or to take the sponsorship that was being offered to me at that point. It was a hard decision, but I think the culmination of the mistakes that were made in a very young career and perhaps leaving home really early and growing up really fast and, and the things I certainly wouldn't take back, but it led me on a very different path that I never thought that I would be led on. And, and yeah, my eyes were just really opened up to a new world. And so as much as a mistake it felt like at the time, obviously I went in a direction that I feel really was my calling. Wow. That's a great story. Sounds like you really found it. I'm just curious because you are in a really unique career that people that probably wouldn't know better would think you're crazy. <laughs> I have moments where I think I'm crazy, so we're all good on that. I definitely have those moments, especially being here on a very frequent basis. So. And you see, you've been there during all this change and you're seeing a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah, I'm just curious if there's something that you'd just like to share in terms of your experience and what you've seen and what you learned. I think you really have to listen to your gut instinct. It sounds kind of woo, woo especially when you are working in conflict zones and then people are military friends are like, what is your security? What is this? I'm like, nothing, nothing. And so people sort of look at that as crazy, but I always sort of preface that with listening and it's very hard to explain, but there's this sort of spidey sense that you get, that you develop in working in places over time and you start to recognize things that aren't right and situations that are just wrong. And there's sometimes there's no rhyme or reason, but I follow it to a T because it's saved me in this kind of weird way. Even example being here when the Taliban, when the city, I was in the North in a city called Mazar Sharif and I was there with my photographer and we'd gone to sort of interview some commandos and they were all sort of saying, this was the night before that it fell. Oh, it's not going to fall. We've got it covered. You know, we've got X amount of special forces there and everything's fine. And I remember just being 
it was a Saturday. It was the day before Carmel fell. And, and Jake, my photographer, and I went. And just the street was strange. And then we ended up hearing different rumors about a front line falling. But nobody was really confirming every, anything. And I was sitting in a kebab cafe that we go to every night. And then suddenly, you know, the, the television, it was something as simple as the TV, which was normally blasting these Indian soap operas, was turned off and it was just this dead silent. And there was just nobody in the street. And we just sort of looked at each other and said, something's wrong. We need to go. We need to run like back now to the hotel. So we just left our food, left everything and ran back to our hotel. And as we're running in, that's when the Taliban was coming in on motorcycles and shooting. And so we got in to sort of just in time and we're on the roof, just watching this city fall and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm trapped. But at the same time, it was that following that intuition of both just sort of going, this just feels wrong. We don't know what's happening, but it feels wrong. And so it was just sort of making it back right, right at that time. And I've had so many of those experiences. Just last week, I was in Jalalabad. It's a province in the eastern part near the Pakistan border. And I went to a house to where the US had actually struck it with a drone at the end of August because the person living there was the, an ISIS-K member who was responsible or was the planner for that horrific airport attack that killed uh, 13 American troops. And so we went there to sort of try to find out who this man was and sort of the ISIS present there. And this you know, young neighbor is sort of sitting there telling us about decapitated bodies that were hanging up the day before and how ISIS was sort of coming in every night. And I just remember having that spotty sense again. And I looked at my interpreter and my photographer and I just went, we need to go right now because you could just feel that something was going to happen if we didn't go at that particular point. And again, I don't know if anything sort of transpired after that, but I just knew that, that I was not going to stay there a minute longer than I needed to. So I think it's really just an understanding of a situation. And I think the intuition comes from experience, but it also just comes from being able to read what's happening around you. And sometimes there's no rhyme or reason, but the body just doesn't lie. And that's something I've really learned to trust. Wow. That's inspiring. You're fearless, maybe a little crazy, but that's really amazing. Yeah. I don't know about fearless, but, but yeah, a little crazy. <laughs> Ollie, thank you so much. I enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for taking the time with me. If those listening are interested in keeping up with you, following you, what would be some good avenues to do that? I try to keep fairly updated on Instagram uh, and my Twitter. They're both the same handles. It's at Holly, H-O-L-L-I-E. S-M-C-K-A-Y. So please follow me there. And my website as well is hollymckay.com and you can order my book through that as well. And I have a sub stack too. So please subscribe. It's usually where I do a weekly or bi-weekly sort of update and my latest stories and things are all in that as well. So you can get it all in one. Awesome. Thanks so much, Holly. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye.